Last week on the channel, I attempted to overclock a Xeon unlocked CPU on this Hunan X99 motherboard, and I was met with a throttling issue where it wouldn't deliver enough power to the CPU for the overclock I was trying to achieve. But like I said at the end of the last video, sometimes the way to find the right answer on the internet is by posting the wrong one. And one of you came through with exactly the answer I was looking for. So let's see what it takes to unlock the potential in this Xeon CPU, and how far were we able to push it. Today's video is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Since the dawn of time, wallets have been two things, leather and bulky. Ridge Wallet's space-saving design is not only easier to carry around, it keeps your money safe with RFID blocking built in. The Ridge expands to hold up to 12 cards, is available with either a money clip or cash strap, and best of all, comes with a lifetime warranty should anything ever go wrong. Available in aluminum, titanium, or carbon fiber, and in a variety of different finishes, there's a Ridge Wallet out there to match your style. Visit ridge.com craft to check out the Ridge Wallet for yourself and receive 10% off your order. That's ridge.com craft. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. If you watched my last video where I was attempting to overclock a Xeon E5 1660V3 on a Hunan X99 motherboard, you probably witnessed my soul leaving my body for a short time. In trying to overclock this CPU for a little while, I thought I had possibly either bricked the motherboard or fried the processor itself. Now, the good news is both are just fine, and in fact, they are working exactly the way I wanted them to now. If you haven't watched that video, I will link it right up here. But long story short is I was trying to modify the BIOS on this motherboard to unlock the TDP on this processor. Even though the CPU does have an unlocked multiplier, it would still limit itself to the TDP of the chip, which in this case was 140 watts. So even if I set a 4.3 or 4.4 gigahertz overclock, as soon as we hit that 140 watt TDP ceiling, it would throttle the CPU back down. And so I was ending up with clocks of about 3.8 gigahertz. Now 3.8 is still faster than the 3.3 gigahertz all-core turbo, but it's still very disappointing for an unlocked CPU, which should be able to hit that 4.3 or 4.4 gigahertz mark. So let's see how we were able to unlock this motherboard to get the full potential out of that 1660 V3. And before we get into it, a huge shout out to Lassie for giving me the exact switches I needed to flip inside of the BIOS, including which menu options to unlock from the AMI BIOS utility. Overall, the process is fairly simple, but you are modifying the BIOS on the motherboard, and as you saw in the last video, bricking your BIOS is a very real possibility, or at the very least, needing a hardware programmer to get it back up and running. Using the same download as the last video, we're going to open up the AMI BIOS utility, and we're going to open the backup copy of my BIOS. First off, we're going to open up the root folder here, go down to Intel RC Setup, go down to Advanced Power Management, and then open up the CPU Advanced PM Tuning. Inside of here, we're gonna set all of the access and use to user, that is, unlock them in the BIOS, as the default permission set denies you access to these folders. Then we're gonna open up the program PP0, and we're gonna do the same thing over here with all of the menu options, that is, set them to user instead of default. Once you have those menu options unlocked, you can go ahead and save your BIOS and close the AMI BIOS tool. Then we're going to flash the BIOS to the motherboard using the FPTW64 tool. To do that, open up a command prompt in administrator mode, type in FPTW64-F to flash the BIOS, and then the name of your BIOS file. Once that process is complete, go ahead and shut down your computer, turn it back on, and get into the BIOS screen. Once you are inside of the BIOS, we're going to go over to the Intel RC setup, go down to Advanced Power Management Configuration, go down to CPU Advanced PM Tuning, and then to the PPO Current Config Control. This right here is the menu option that locks the CPU to the TDP defined by the chip. So if this is a 140 watt chip, the most the motherboard will deliver to the CPU is 140 watts. So we're going to turn that from Auto to Manual. We're going to go to Current Config and turn that to Enable. And then under current limitation, we're going to set this to 2048, which is the maximum value. Now, fair warning here, this pretty much disables all safeguards within the motherboard and the CPU as well. So if you give it voltage, it will take that voltage. And that can do one of two things. It can fry your CPU, or it could potentially fry the VRM on the motherboard if the current draw is too high. Once that is all set up, we're going to go back all the way to the Intel RC setup and go down to overclocking features. Scroll down to the processor menu, and this is where you enter the unlocked multiplier value for the CPU. Now, I've already dialed in what the CPU can handle, but if you haven't overclocked your chip before, you're gonna kinda wanna go through the steps of making sure you get a stable overclock. 
Now for gaming workloads, I peaked pretty much right around 4.2 gigahertz at what I consider a safe voltage of 1.25. Now this motherboard BIOS, while probably the most complete that I've seen out of a Chinese market board, it still has its bugs and issues. For example, the AVX2 negative offset option down here at the bottom doesn't actually work, which is rather unfortunate because for gaming workloads, I was able to get the CPU all the way to 4.3 gigahertz at some fairly safe voltages. However, Cinebench would crash about halfway through every run that I tried at that 4.3 gigahertz level. Ideally, I'd like to enter a value of two in here, which would reduce the processor speed by 200 megahertz and allow Cinebench to run stably at around 4.1. However, this menu option doesn't actually apply. Whenever an AVX workload hits the CPU, it will still try to boost to 4.3. The good news though is that with a Cinebench workload, 4.3 gigahertz was drawing 185 watts. So this unlock totally worked. But as I said, for gaming, the max overclock I was able to achieve was a 4.3 gigahertz. We're gonna do a manual voltage and I was able to dial that in at about 1.28 volts. On Haswell chips, it is not recommended to go above 1.30 for full-time use. So I was pretty happy to get it dialed in at 1.28. And if everything looks good, we're gonna go ahead and save our configuration. And finally, with all of that done, how are the overclocks actually performing? Well, starting with Cinebench at stock speeds, we see a single threaded score of 141 and a multi-threaded score of 1388. Now those numbers seem pretty decent, but that's until you put it into the context of some other modern CPUs. For example, the Ryzen 5 2600 overclocked to 4.1 gigahertz is able to hit a 1379 multi-threaded speed and a single threaded speed of 171 leaving this one in the dust as far as single-threaded performance and tying it with only six cores and 12 threads on the multi-threaded side. Overclocking the 1660V3 to 4.2 gigahertz gets us a single-threaded score of 170 and a multi-threaded score of 1639, essentially putting us in a dead heat with a stock speed Ryzen 7 1700. Unfortunately, those results paint kind of a bleak picture as far as value per dollar goes, because this CPU was $145 off AliExpress, and the motherboard was $105 on top of that. Compare that to something like an X370 motherboard, which I have seen sold on eBay for as little as $80 recently, and a Ryzen 7 1700 Pro, which is on AliExpress right now for $96. That gets you a modern platform with eight cores and 16 threads, and the same amount of speed as this overclocked power sucker does. Why do I call this a power sucker? Well, remember, it took 185 watts to run Cinebench at 4.2 gigahertz, and the Ryzen 7 1700, that's a 65 watt part. Even with the performance per dollar kind of tanking with those results, I did go ahead and run this through 3 Mark Firestrike and Time Spy just to see what a difference the overclock made. Firestrike went from an overall score of 17,100 at stock speeds to 19,300 under a 4.3 gigahertz overclock. Much of that gain was on the backs of the physics score, jumping a full 32% over the stock speeds. Time Spy shows similar yet less impressive results, jumping from a 7600 to a 7800. Here yet again, the CPU score led the charge with a full 21% improvement over the stock clocks. So there you have it, a 4.3 gigahertz overclock on a Xeon E5 1660V3 mounted to a Hunan X99 motherboard. But would I recommend this combo? Now, in a number of previous videos, I have recommended the Chinese X79 or X99 as a platform, mainly because if you live in a part of the world where you cannot get access to new hardware, this makes a great performance alternative for the money that you can spend. In a number of previous videos, I have recommended the X79 or X99 Chinese platforms with some used Xeons. However, I've never been able to do an apples to apples comparison in a worldwide market. That is AliExpress pricing versus AliExpress pricing. I've mentioned in those previous videos that if you have access to an Amazon or a Newegg or a Micro Center, that you can get new parts for less money that do perform better than this, even if on paper, they don't look as good. For example, a Ryzen 5 2400G for 115 bucks will blow the doors off a of Xeon E5 1650, which at the release of the 2400G was still selling for like $150 online. But on AliExpress, a Ryzen 7 1700 Pro and an X370 motherboard will cost you less money than a Hunan X99 and a 1660 V3. So in conclusion, pretty decent performance gains at the overclocked speeds, but in the end, still not worth it as a platform. 
Do you have any recommendations for platforms that I should check out? Let me know down in the comments below. And on your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads, my once weekly live show for the latest in beer and tech news. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. And I'm not going to finish that because it's terrible. Cheers. Beer for today is from Wichita Brewing Company in Wichita, Kansas, and it is the Wu Shock Wheat. It is the official beer of the Wichita State University Shockers. This is a 4.5% wheat ale with lemon and lime added to it. Well, it certainly smells like a wheat ale, or at least like a blue moon or a shock top. Boy, that is uh, completely and utterly flavorless and kind of thick. It it stays with you. Uh, I was expecting something a little bit more crisp, you know, light bodied at, at four and a half percent. I taste a little bit of lime, not really any lemon. Um, missing all of the wheat flavor in it. I don't know about this one. Yeah, I am just not a fan of this. It's like someone poured a half a bloom moon into a Sprite or whatever the Safeway Select version of Sprite is. This is the LaCroix of wheat ales. If you haven't seen that previous video, go ahead and click right up here. Right? Here. Crap, I don't remember. Here, I think it's here. We're gonna go with here. No, it's left. That's right. Okay. Isn't it? Yes, left side, <laughs> right up here.